Hello everybody, we start today with the first class of this introductory course in mechanics for engineering studies. We're going to start with the first module that we've called actually module zero of physical quantities and vector algebra. We've called it module zero because it is going to be more than a study of physics. It'll be a study of basic math concepts that we need to successfully tackle this course that we're starting today. Within this first unit or module zero, we are going to have three presentations. Today's presentation, the one on physical quantities, will be followed by a second presentation on the law of homogeneity. And we will finish with a short review of vector algebra. Starting with today's class, what we are going to do is to list and ensure that the concept of physical quantities is perfectly framed. We will explore what the science that interests us focuses on, which will be relevant to us in the study of all these mechanics modules, the physical science. We are going to see how measurements are made, what we understand by magnitudes, by units, and by quantities. And finally, we will analyze different systems of units with which we can work. What do we understand by physics? In general, the science of physics is a fundamental science that is the basis of many scientific fields. And it is concerned with explaining everything that happens in nature around us. A definition that we could take, quite accurate, is that of the Spanish physicist Julio Palacios, who tells us that physics is the fundamental science that studies the processes in which nature does not change. And how is this study carried out? Well, this study is carried out like any other science through the scientific method. How are we going to work, therefore, and how do we work in physics? Well, what it is about is, from the observation of a phenomenon, as our new friends who are going to help us in all the studies of Amanda and Jay are doing in this image, is to develop a series of hypotheses that try to explain in detail any kind of phenomenon they are observing. From experimentation, they will see if those hypotheses address all aspects and try to explain everything that interests them about the phenomenon they are observing. If there is full agreement between those hypotheses and the experimentation to explain that phenomenon, in the end, those hypotheses will acquire the status of a physical law. If there is some small disagreement between those hypotheses and what we want to explain, what we will have to do is to resort again to new hypotheses or rethink some of the first ones so that, from experimentation, little by little we will achieve 100% agreement. In the end, we will arrive at the concept of the physical law and its global formulation that allows us to explain the phenomenon that was of interest to us. What we will always do to explain these phenomena is to use what we know as physical quantities. Of all the quantities that we can use to explain the phenomena that occur around us, it turns out that not all of these quantities can be qualified as physical quantities. For us to be able to do so, we have to require that this quantity corresponds to an observable phenomenon that can be measured or quantified. If it cannot be measured or quantified, it cannot qualify as a physical quantity. Now, how is this measurement of magnitude performed? Well, to measure means to compare. In order to measure it, what we will do is to compare what we are interested in with a previously defined standard, which we will deal with later. At the end, from that measurement, we will take the quantity of that physical magnitude and we will quantify it. This quantity will have, therefore, two parts to be perfectly determined. The quantity will be a set of what the measurement is and the unit in which that measurement is being expressed. As examples of physical quantities, we have the length of a rope, the time between two instantaneous events, for example, the mass of bodies, the speed of light, etc. Magnitudes that are not physical magnitudes, to give examples, so that we realize the difference, for beauty, smell and taste will not be physical magnitudes. They are observable, but they are not measurable. They are quite subjective quantities. Let's look at this example here. In this case, we have Jay throwing a tennis ball upwards. We can look at the observation of the phenomenon. What phenomenon? The movement of the ball. What is the magnitude we are going to analyze? The magnitude we are going to analyze is going to be the velocity. What quantity do we have to work with? The quantity we are going to work with is the velocity of the thrown ball. And for that quantity, we have to take into account the system of units. We can use the international system as the system of units and therefore we will give the velocity in units of meters per second or we can work in another system that we will then better qualify or better determine as the CGS system and then the units for the velocity would be in centimeters per second. 
In these two systems of units, in the international system, we would say that the velocity during the throwing of the ball can be approximately 2 meters per second. Or in centimeters per second, the velocity would be 200 centimeters per second. We see that the quantity does not depend on the unit used. However, the measurement does depend on the unit used. 2 if measured in the international system and 200 if measured in the CGS system. Now, physical quantities are further divided into two large groups, depending on the amount of information we need for them to be perfectly determined. We have a first group that we are going to define as physical quantities that are scalar quantities. They will be those that in order to be perfectly determined, we only need a, a real number, a numerical value. Their algebra, therefore, that we need to work with them is going to be the algebra of the real numbers. And they are added by accumulation. So as an example of scalar quantities, we have mass, energy, time, and so on. In the other group, we have vector quantities. In this case, in order for them to be perfectly determined, we need in addition the numerical value, a modulus, which would be the direction and sense, therefore, the perfect mathematical entity to represent these physical quantities is going to be the vector. Therefore, to work with them, we are going to use the algebra of the vectors, the vector algebra. And they are going to be added according to the polygon rule. Examples of these vector quantities are velocity, acceleration, force, and so on. When working with all these physical quantities, in order to be able to communicate better among the different people who study the phenomena, we will take into account the systems of units in which we work. In a system of units, we will have to take into account two fundamental parts. On one hand, what would be the set of fundamental magnitudes that define a given system of units, which we could define as the minimum number of physical magnitudes from which any phenomenon could be studied. We will see that if we look around a little, we could think that we need to study any phenomenon in nature in a large number of physical quantities. However, we are going to see that it is not so, that with a reduced number of physical quantities that we are going to define as fundamental, it is enough to study a physical phenomenon, and the rest of the quantities that we will need, we will call them as derived quantities. What we will do will be to relate these derived quantities with the fundamental ones from what is known as the fundamental laws, which would be the systems of defining equations. We see here an example of derived quantities. Let's see why. In terms of fundamental or other derived quantities, let's consider an expression for acceleration, which we know can be given in terms of velocity and time, or in terms of the position vector and time, or in terms of the force vector and mass. Let's see how to get to the whole expression that allows us to do all the analysis that I want. Here we see where I would have the expression for the acceleration of the ball from the force that we are inducing. It turns out that in the international system, the system of units defined as the international system, to be well determined, I only need a very small number of fundamental magnitudes, which are seven. And these fundamental magnitudes defined by the international system are the length and we use as units for this physical magnitude, the meter. The symbol would be the one that appears in parentheses for each of them. Mass, unit kilogram, time, unit second, amount of substance, unit mole, luminous intensity, candela, for temperature, the Kelvin, and for electric current intensity, the ampere. We have two quantities that we call supplementary mainly because there is not yet total agreement as to their assimilation into the group of fundamental or derived quantities, which would be the plane angle, unit, the radian, or the solid angle, unit, the steradian. The derived quantities will be related to the fundamental ones based on the defining equations. And for the different physical systems that we can find, we will have different types of physical systems according to the set of units we choose. For example, the international system for the units that characterize the mechanical part of the length of the mass and time we would have meter, kilogram, second. The CGS system, centimeter, gram, second. For the MTS system would be the meter, ton, and second. And for an Anglo-Saxon system that would be the FPS would be foot, pound, and second. As examples of derived quantities that also have their own name we have Newton for force, Joule for energy, Watt for power, 
or Pascal for pressure. Therefore, summarizing to conclude this first presentation of this course, we must take into account that not all quantities can be classified as physical quantities. For a system of units to be very well defined or determined, we need to define which are the fundamental magnitudes, the rest of them will be derived, and which are the defining equations, and that the different units chosen will determine the different types of system of units in which we are going to work. We will continue in the next class. Thank you very much.